90 minutes ahead of you. We are recording this program for um, for participants who couldn't make it tonight, and we'll send it out after afterward. My name is Jody Bromberg. I'm the CEO of 18 Doors, and I'll be the moderator of our discussion this evening. And I am really excited to be here. Just a housekeeping detail before I introduce our panelists is um, we will, over the next 75 to 90 minutes, um, give everybody uh, quick introductions, and then Rabbi Josh and Rabbi Ben will give them an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, their recent book, which is terrific and I highly recommend. Uh, and then I have a bunch of questions for everybody, and we will have hopefully a vibrant discussion and open up the chat for Q&A and hopefully get to some of your questions as well. Uh, and um, let's dive in. Um, as I said, uh, I am the CEO of 18 Doors, where I have been since 2015, um, where I had the pleasure of working with Ed Case, who was, who was the founder of 18 Doors, uh, formerly first known as Interfaith Family, um, and who is a friend and mentor, and now um, not only the author of his own book, but um, the the executive director of the Center for Radically Inclusive Judaism, and really was the driving force behind tonight's program and discussion. Uh, also with us, uh, Rabbi Josh Stanton, who is the director and leader of leadership and formation at CLAL, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership, as well as a spiritual leader at East End Temple. He is co-author with um, Rabbi Ben Spratt, who's also here tonight, of Awakenings, which hopefully you can see, American Jewish Transformation in Identity, Leadership, and Belonging. And uh, as I said, it's a really exciting book and I think says some really interesting thing, things, um, which we'll dive into tonight. Um, rabbi Ben Spratt is the Senior Rabbi of Congregation Road of Shalom in Manhattan. And his religious journey has taken him from Orthodox Reconstructionist and Renewal Worlds to becoming ordained from the Conservative Movement's Jewish Theological Seminary and eventually landing him as a rabbi at Rodef Shalom. And finally, last but certainly not least, is my friend and colleague, Rabbi Robin Frisch, uh, who is the director of the Rukin Rabbinic Fellowship here at 18 Doors and also the founder of Mazel Tov's. Uh, and Rabbi Frisch is proud to work with a select group of rabbis who participate in our fellowship through the US and Canada who provide programs and workshops and services for interfaith couples and families within their communities. Um, so let's dive in. And I first wanna give the floor to Rabbis Ben and Josh um, and give you a, a few minutes each to, to kick us off. Thank you so much, Jody, and what a joy to be on a panel with such incredible leaders, um, really in the path of reshaping and imagining American Judaism. So my beloved friend, my chavuta, my study partner, um, and my co-author, Josh Stanton, and I have been working together building for uh, over a decade. And one of the things that we noticed very early on is that in the American Jewish population, we tend to be obsessed with the most lacrimose stories, the stories of decline, the stories of decay, and the stories um, that really place our own existential understanding on the brink of annihilation. Um, and it is with that that we started to kind of notice the way in which the story was ignoring a great deal of data. And so in just one moment, I'm going to lift up a little bit of that data, and then uh, Josh will help, you know, expand this really into the heart of our book. But we noticed that for decades, American Judaism was framing intermarriage as the great silent or even second Holocaust. And yet, in the more recent Pew studies, we've noticed that actually that has not played out in any way, shape, or form. The American Jewish population has grown at a faster rate than the American population, that while the intermarriage rate is at 72%, we get to find that nearly that percentage of uh, multi-faith couples actually raise their children Jewish. And now one of the most exciting things is that we have millions of people that do not identify as being Jewish, that are, have Jewish affinity and Jewish adjacency, that see that this is a well of wisdom that they want and wish to be a part of. And for us, as we were going back to our biblical origin story of seeing the great Moses, see that uh, his path would involve him marrying from outside of the Israelites. And with all of the challenges and the tribulations, the story that Josh and I in our own rabbinic journeys centered on and used as a beacon really for this book um, was that of Moses' father-in-law Jethro, 
of what it was to take the Midian pagan high priest and have him embraced in the Israelite community to the point where when he was leaving, the Israelites cried out and said, Al nata zovotanu, please don't leave us, for you have become our very eyes. And we think about that for a moment, that many of the ways that we shape the story is that the outsider, the marginalized one, is the threat to our community, and forget that our story was always one that started as being the marginalized, and it is in our own inclusivity, actually, that we find the path of maybe a new awakening. So it's always very difficult to speak after Rabbi Ben Spratt, one of the uh, great minds of our time in the Jewish world. But I want to continue with the notion of Jethro. And we read actually when he is reintroduced to the scene in Exodus, Jethro heard something that drew him back as a Midianite priest to Moses and to the Israelites. And what our commentators debate is, what did he hear? And the presumption is he heard of the Exodus, but he heard something so powerful from the Israelite community that he wanted to go and connect himself to it. And that didn't mean necessarily that he converted to Judaism, although a lot of commentators presume that, but something made him want to reconnect, learn from, and actually also teach and contribute invaluably to the Jewish community. And what we awaken to is the idea that there are so many Jethros today who are drawn to Judaism, not as a noun, but Judaism as a verb, a set of lived actions and practices. And much in the way that some of us practice yoga, and it doesn't diminish Hinduism, that we have adapted and adopted a practice that originated in Hinduism, much in the way that some of us practice forms of meditation that originated in Buddhism, and it doesn't diminish Buddhism that we do breathing exercises and other exercises to bring us into the present. A lot of people have adapted and adopted Jewish practices, not in an appropriative way, not to say this is the real Judaism the way we practice, but to say Judaism is a wisdom tradition that has withstood the test of time and remarkable trials and tribulations throughout history. And since it has withstood it, I have faith and trust that there are universal teachings that I can draw from as well. And Ben referenced the millions, you know, very casually, we're talking hundreds of thousands to millions of people who have connected to Jewish practice. I know of people, some of whom ultimately converted to Judaism, who found Shiva to be incredibly helpful in a society devoid of mourning rituals that walk with people beyond the burial itself. I have encountered people who have seasonal affective disorder and other things that really peak around Hanukkah when it is the darkest outside and the nights are the longest. And they've actually reached out and said, I, I don't want to appropriate. A, a Hanukkah is not a menorah is not something from my tradition, but I need something that gives me a bit more light right now. Are you as a rabbi okay with me lighting a Hanukkah? To which I said, yes, of course. How beautiful that the light can expand beyond our communities. And so what we're seeing is a veritable awakening within the Jewish community when organizations like 18 Doors and Radically Inclusive Judaism are transforming the landscape and moving us beyond the longstanding institutions, and we're also seeing lives transformed by Judaism. And so it's not even about who's going to convert or who's not going to convert. How are Jews marrying or how are Jews not marrying? That's the wrong framing. 18 Doors has been so far ahead for so long, and we're finally catching up, uh, Ben and I, and saying, wait a minute, what if this is the starting point of transformation of lives, where Judaism as an inherent good, or as we say at Klal, Judaism as a public good, can change people's lives for the better without in any way diminishing the multiplicity of traditions associated with it, and wherein we can actually come to welcome people who are Jewish, welcome people who are Jewishly connected, and inspire people well beyond any borders that we've artificially created for ourselves.
Ben and Josh, thank you for those opening remarks. And I appreciate so much the way that um, you have framed this in the positive and about the opportunities that we have to transform um, Judaism and our lives and communities uh, when people who aren't Jewish uh, but are Jewishly adjacent or married to someone Jewish or find meaning in Judaism um, connect there. That said, um, there is still a stigma that faces interfaith couples and families, which I know we have all talked about. Um, and so therefore, I want to start us off really at a place that I think gets at maybe some of that stigma. And that's really this question of whether liberal rabbinic seminaries <clears throat> should admit or ordain rabbinic students who are in interfaith relationships. It continues to be a controversial issue um, back from before when the Reconstruction Rabbinic College um, accepted Jews who were married to people who weren't Jewish into their seminary and before that to the secular humanists. Um, we know that Hebrew College here in the Boston area is considering it and Hebrew Union College has indicated that it will over the years. And so my question to our panelists tonight is what's your position and why? And I'm going to ask Ed to start us off and then Rabbi Robin and then Ben and Josh uh, to follow up and I'll add my thoughts uh, at the end. Ed. Great, thank you, Jody. Uh, and I, I wanna thank 18 Doors and Jody for hosting this. And I'm really um, I'm, uh, thrilled to be in dialogue with uh, Ben and Josh. And I love the way you talk, I wanna say right at the beginning. Um, and before I answer the question directly, I wanna just briefly talk about my, my uh, perspective on, on all of these issues. The first thing I wanna say is why I think your book is really important. And I think Jody touched on this a little bit. The first, there's at least three reasons. The first reason is you talk about interfaith marriage in such a positive way. It is really refreshing. Uh, it's not, it's, it, it's, it's uncommon and it's very refreshing. Uh, when you say things like intermarriage opens up remarkable opportunities, it's, it's, it's music to my ears. The second thing is you, you emphasize the importance of inclusion of, uh, of, of the partners who come from different faith backgrounds. You say many of our institutions remain outdated in their notions of belonging rather than actively embracing people who seek Jewish learning and spiritual practices. And the third reason is uh, you, you see Judaism as a system that is not just for Jews, but is also for those who do Jewish, the distinction between being Jewish and, and doing Jewish. You say our focus should be on doing Jewish, not simply being Jewish in a passive way. Um, so I think all of that stuff is, is really, uh, it's just rare. Uh, and, and you're very highly regarded rabbis. You have the ability to get the attention of a lot of Jewish leaders. And so I think it's great to be having you talk that way. So in the, in the book, you say that your goal is how do we enable more people to find meaning in Jewish ritual and ideas and community and experience. And that's my, always been my goal. And with interfaith couples, I think that the key is to help the partners from different faith backgrounds who are interested in living Jewishly to feel included, to feel that they belong, to feel that they're part of Jewish groups, if that's the way they want to be treated. And the, the 2020 Pew report found that 72% of in-married Jews felt a great deal sense of belonging to the Jewish people, but only 27% of in, intermarried people felt the same way. So my theory is that uh, the partners from different faith backgrounds will not feel that they belong unless they are thought of as equal and treated as equal to their Jewish partners. They won't feel belonging if Jews express attitudes that interfaith marriage is less valued or, or that the partners from different faith backgrounds are less valued or that the partners need to convert in order to, in order to be in. And they won't feel included if they're not offered unrestricted participation in Jewish ritual the way their partners do. That's my, that's my theory. Um, and I think it's con still controversial in, in, a, in many parts of the liberal Jewish community. And I'm, I'll be interested to know what you think about this, my, the equal uh, consideration and treatment theory. But to get to the question, it's actually the seminary question to me is a very easy one. The only rationale for not ordaining 
a rabbinic student who is in an interfaith relationship is because interfaith marriage is if you view interfaith marriage as a bad thing, as something that is less valued, and if you think that partners from different faith backgrounds are, are undesirable. The CCAR, the Reform Rabbis Association support for that policy uh, is by saying that the ideal is that Jews should marry Jews and that uh, interfaith marriage tends to frustrate the building of Jewish homes and lives and that rabbis should be role models and exemplars. If you say in marriage is the ideal, then interfaith marriage is necessarily less than ideal. Um, and the impact of that attitude is to push interfaith couples away because who would want to be part of a community uh, that views their relationship and their marriage partner in a devalued way? And if we want interfaith couples to be Jewishly engaged, what better role models would there be than an, than an intermarried rabbi? So I have uh, felt for many years that these policies should be changed. I've been privately lobbying some of the faculty of Hebrew College. I've written publicly in the foreword twice about HUC. Uh, and I'm very interested to know what, uh, what you think about it. So I've actually been asked to speak, not that I can speak on anyone else's behalf, but to represent what I'm hearing from our fellows. I've worked, we have about 30 fellows now and 10 who are alumni. So the conversations that we've been having, but first I wanna say on my own behalf, what Ed, just to echo what Ed just said. Uh, first of all, for me, when I started Interfaith Family 10 years ago, if this question came up, I would have said, are you crazy? You, you know, I'm very accepting, but you can't have a rabbi who's married to someone who isn't Jewish. But having worked for 10 years, not so much with rabbis, but with people in interfaith relationships, I agree with Ed 100% about this idea of role models. You know, we, we want to have people who are LGBTQ at the forefront of Judaism so other people are LGBTQ can look at them and identify. We want to have Jews of color at the forefront of Judaism so other people of color can say, I'm going to feel comfortable in this community. I'm not going to be alone. So I don't know why people in interfaith relationships are any different. And the way I understand role models is they're supposed to be people who feel and look like you and you can relate to. So if 72% of liberal Jews are now marrying someone who isn't Jewish, what better role model than a rabbi who takes seriously Judaism and happens to be married to someone who isn't Jewish. So that's on behalf of myself. I can't say all of the fellows agree with me. Of course, they all have their own opinions. I will share um, one interesting story though. We have uh, one fellow and, and this really didn't even come up in the fellowship very often. But one fellow shared as he was finishing the fellowship that when he first interviewed for his job a number of years ago, they actually asked him at his interview, what do you think of rabbis, who, the idea of a rabbi who's married to someone not Jewish? And at that point, he was uncomfortable with it. And he shared that. And he was being honest, but he also knew that's what the congregation wanted to hear. And apparently they, that kind of pushed him over against another candidate who said, I'm fine with that. And he said, but now that I finished this fellowship and I've worked with couples in this intense environment and really gotten to hear their stories and I've talked to other fellows, I've totally changed my mind on this. And I thought that was an amazing thing that just the experience of really getting to know, not what his colleagues had to say, but what the couples he was working with had to say and who they were and what an impact it could have on them was incredibly powerful. Um, I'll also say that we do have a couple of fellows who are in interfaith relationships themselves, interfaith marriages, or have been in interfaith relationships throughout their lives. They're obviously very serious Jews. They're rabbis. They're wonderful rabbis. Most, not most, but many of them, the younger ones in particular, are from interfaith homes and obviously grew up finding Judaism to be very important or discovered at a relatively young age that this was a crucial part of their identity. Um, and then I'll just conclude by saying another issue similar that's come up that we've asked the fellows about is how would you feel if it was your own child? Because I think in many ways, that's the ultimate test is would you say it's okay, but if it were your own child, either real or hypothetical, what would your reaction be? And I have to be honest, the, the reactions are mixed there and it's not at all reflective of movements. There are some conservative rabbis who are like, that's fine as long as they find someone they love and are in a loving relationship, I hope it'll involve Judaism, great. And then there's some more quote unquote liberal or from more liberal movements rabbis who say, it would be really hard for me if I'm gonna be very honest, which they're entitled to their opinions. Um, so, you know, I think it's just another way of saying we can be okay with something, but then when it really hits close to home, for many rabbis, it is can still be a challenge. 
So for me, in answering this question, you know, I think back to when I was a rabbinic student at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and during my time there was when JTS changed its policy about openly admitting um, queer, uh, openly at that point, gay and lesbian uh, students. And uh, it was really interesting to be there at that time, because certainly I was well aware that there were students who already identified as being gay but felt that the policy of the seminary meant that it either had to change uh, the seminary they were going to apply to or simply go into the closet. And it was a really important moment for me to be able to see that when we have seminaries that have to be distinguishing the right eligible students to be the future leaders of the movement, but are doing it based on identity and family structure, we get to see the end result actually creates real um, rupture and I would say even trauma to individuals. And it creates this ongoing gap between what we imagine is the ideal and what is the real. Um, and for me, going to a conservative seminary, the idea that we as rabbis were obligated to certain kinds of behaviors um, that our constituency wouldn't be obligated, to be obligated to certain kinds of relationship, and maybe even to certain kinds of sexual or gender identity, I lift it up into this conversation for a moment um, because while I have never worked in a seminary and I'm sure that it is a difficult job indeed, it is also, I think, important for any strategic move of an institution to look at the winds of change and to decide what are the front lines that matter most in defining our leadership. And for me, this is a question really of just inevitability. 72% of non-Orthodox Jews are marrying people who are outside the faith. I happen to be a product of a marriage between a person who is Jewish and a person who is not Jewish. Our senior cantor happens to be a, similarly, a person who is uh, the product of a person who is married to somebody who is Jewish um, and somebody who is not Jewish. And we are starting to see that what used to be an anomaly in Jewish leadership is now becoming more and more definitional. And so long as the seminaries want to live up perhaps a definition of an ideal that may have existed in a prior generation to address a different need, we miss the opportunity to have our seminaries incubating the kind of tools that activate leaders, leadership identity to create a sense of belonging for those around. And for me, one of the inspiring experiences is going to Cuba. Um, and the Jewish community in Cuba cheers every time there is an interfaith marriage because there is an opportunity for a new person to help invigorate the community with new ideas and energy and vitality. And I wonder what would be if we could look at the, again, the bloom of American Judaism to defy all odds and see that it's not in spite of interfaith marriage, but it is because of it that we have the chance to learn from those who stood at the margins outside our communities and had them enliven and invigorate our own homes and our own communities and congregations. I would add to that only that a, a trope that comes up again and again in the book is that institutions without a clearly defined mission tend to lash out at people. It's really important to define who a rabbi cannot be, who a cantor cannot be, who an educator cannot be. Well, what about describing those roles in a positive way? And the reality is those roles are in such flux right now, people are not even able to articulate a multiplicity of positive options. And so instead we create a bogeyman. Lo and behold, if, if anyone who is studying is married to someone who is not Jewish or in a serious relationship with them, that is what a cantor rabbi educator is not. And if that's all we can do, is defined in the negative what a role is not, we're in really serious trouble. And Ben and I probably did not uh, win friends and influence people in the seminary world. We advocated a 14-way merger um, between seminaries in the United States um, so that they could, instead of uh, over-investing in real estate, invest in human beings. But even if uh, that vision doesn't come to be in its entirety, what if we just started by describing what these new roles look like and what it is to be a Jewish leader in the many forms that that can take on? And once we start to find language that is positive and language that was certainly lacking from my rabbinic education over the course of five years, we might be able to get beyond this issue. This strikes me as a symptom of far greater malaise 
it seems like something that everyone wants to latch on to. And who are the people being used and victimized? People who are deeply connected to Jewish community, who might or might not be Jewish themselves, but who are falling prey to a system that is listless and lacking in clear mission focus. Thank you, the four of you, for your thoughtful comments. And I will just add, uh, or just perhaps underscore, as Ben said, the rupture and trauma, as um, Josh said, you know, people who are used and victimized, who want to be part of Jewish community. And I think that underscores the impact of policies um, like these, even though I will say that I think lots of folks who um, are associated with the reform movement, for example, on the HUC's policy, aren't aware of the policy. And uh, and when they do find out about it, I think that's when the, the trauma occurs. Um, and I think that moving beyond that uh, allow, would allow us the opportunity to open up a space for people who come from interfaith families, both the children of, the parents of, interfaith couples themselves. Um, and I will say I use interfaith as a term of art, um, but that there are so many ways that folks who are married to someone who's Catholic or Hindu or Christian or Buddhist or atheist or um, another religion uh, identify and the language that they use and I, that I think that we ought to always go with the language that the families in front of us are using to divine themselves. Um, however, interfaith families have become a term of art in part um, due to the great work that Ed Case did as the founder of Interfaith Family. And so that is the language I'm using tonight. Um, that said, you know, I think one of, there are two ways I, that this impact, that this policy I think impacts folks. One is the, um, this issue of the stigmatization, but I think that the other is that it, it, it deprives, all of us of um, people who would become rabbis, but for the fact that these policies exist. And I think that's actually the real loss is the folks, and, uh, and I, I know several of them who've chosen different career paths as a result. Some of them uh, served on our staff at one point or still do. And, um, and they walk away from Jewish leadership because, uh, because of policies like that. So, um, let us move on. We have a lot to cover here. Um, our next question. Um, there is a trope or memes all over the place around December where uh, that Jews go out for Chinese food on Christmas. Um, it's in the media. It's on social media. It, it's the mainstream media. Um, it's hard to avoid in December. Um, and it's often the joke that in Jewish communal institutions that people turn to when they're talking about um, Hanukkah and Christmas. And yet, uh, there are many Jews who are having Christmas dinner at their homes, at uh, the families of their partners from uh, Christian backgrounds. Um, and so our question here, our next question is, um, is saying Jews eat Chinese on Christmas or Jews go to the movies on Christmas, is it harmless humor? Or uh, is it a microaggression? Or is it something that is simply that others, um, couples and families like mine and, and Ed's? Who wants to kick us off? I would, if I may. All right, so why don't we go Ed, Josh, Ben, Robin. Okay. So, so in the book, Ben and Josh, you talk about implicit assumptions that exclude people. And I, I, I think I always have felt that this is one of them. And uh, the foreword recently published a list of 125 American Jews over the 125 years they've been publishing who shaped our world. And the entry for 2010 was uh, Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan, because at her confirmation hearing, Lindsey Graham asked her what she had been doing on Christmas. And she said, like all Jews, I was probably at a Chinese restaurant. And at the time I wrote a blog post say, uh, titled Memo to Elena Kagan, not all Jews spend Christmas at Chinese restaurants. 
and I made the point that Jody made that increasing numbers of people are, are having Christmas dinner. Um, so there's a book about Jews and Christmas by Joshua Plout, and he says the Chinese restaurant has become a place for us to announce our identity and a place where identity expresses itself in a Jewish way on Christmas. And I, uh, I, I feel that that is off-putting to a large and growing segment of the community. Um, I'm not opposed to people announcing their Jewish identity, or, and I'm not opposed to uh, expressing and maintaining Jewish distinctiveness. Although I'm interested to know what you think about that. When, because when we talk about Jewish, uh, Judaism as a wisdom system for everyone, it really does raise questions about what is the role of Jewish identity and all of that. Um, but I do think it, it's important to uh, uh, express and maintain distinctiveness in ways that don't alienate uh, and don't otherize Jews who are in interfaith relationships. You know, I, and I, I feel a little bit like a, like a Grinch, not to mix metaphors, I guess, because it, it is, I mean, it is, it is, it is humorous, but um, it has this negative consequence. And I try to think, well, how, how could we, how could we express this thing? Well, we could say uh, it's a Jewish tradition to make latkes at, at, at Hanukkah. And there's a lot of stuff in social media about what kind of lockets did you make? You make this kind, you make that kind. That I don't think that otherizes anyone. But when people go on and on on social media about where they had their Chinese food, I think it it it, I, it seems like a problem to me. Um, I think there's a more difficult one also that I I, I actually would would be interested. in. I think Robin alluded to this, and that is the uh, that that is the uh, uh, having or expressing a preference that that uh, that someone marry uh, that a Jewish person marry a Jew. And I, I have actually been guilty of, of this myself. Um, when a parent who inquires about a prospective date or mate for their child and, and asks, is the person Jewish? Um, I, I did that myself once when I was standing next to my, uh, uh, then my future and now my current son-in-law uh, when we were talking about someone else. And he, he reacted in a, you know, as kind of a startled and, and put off way, which, which was totally legitimate. Um, so the question is really, is it okay to have a preference that, you're, that your child marries someone Jewish and, and is it okay to express it? And, and since uh, it's hard, to, hard not to express preferences, I, uh, is it okay to have that preference? But that's it. So I, I wanna, I, I think I was next in line and I, I wanna preface my response in saying that I'm actively working on my sensitivity but I would describe it as still in a place of mediocrity. And, um, and I would start by just saying that I would probably have to listen because I don't even know how that would land for different people. Um, I am a father of a four-year-old, so I, I have dad jokes of many. And this sounds to me like a dad joke, although I don't know how different people would receive it. Um, so I, I guess I would say that I would have to listen. I would have to keep working on myself because I would be the first to acknowledge that I have a tin ear. Um, one of the things Ben and I tried to do in our book it, very early on was an acknowledgement of perspectives. We are two straight, cis, uh, Ashkenazi men, and that means that we're going to miss a lot. Um, we did the best we could, but we are essentially saying, look, we're going to get this wrong. It's a matter of degree, not if. And I would say the same is probably true about the question of Chinese food on Christmas. Have I told that joke before? I'm sure I have. Um, does this conversation make me want to reconsider? Yes, absolutely. What I'm wondering about, what actually came up, because Ashka normative was something that uh, was very evident from the context of the book, um, that uh, that is one of the many issues in terms of uh, definitions and the idea that a large percentage of American Jews come from some kind of Ashkenazi heritage and that therefore that should dictate all of American Judaism is uh, an issue that blinds us to a beautiful possibility that originated among Maghrebi Jews, Jews from Morocco, Tunisia, elsewhere. I keep wondering about Maimuna uh, or Maimunia. I'm probably mispronouncing it as the Ashkenazi Jew that I am. Um, but the day after Passover, the night after Passover, um, many Jews of uh, Mizrahi heritage gather and celebrate, potentially it, it's connected to Maimonides' birthday, potentially it's connected to any number of things, but it involves their neighbors who are not Jewish. Why? 
often takes a while to actually get all of the ingredients and supplies, and it's logistically hard for traditionally observant Jews to get uh, enough chametz to actually cook and prepare this feast. And so it winds up being wonderful Muslim and Christian and uh, uh, neighbors of all different backgrounds bringing over food and bread products and, and incredible meals to their Jewish neighbors and then them sharing together. What if there were a similar opportunity around Christmas? What if we didn't have to be so afraid of uh, you know defining who we were in positive terms that we might be able to show up at a Christmas dinner and not be terrified that somehow that would um, uh, take away all vestiges of Jewish heritage? Um, it seems like we've yet again created a straw person, a straw man, a straw human, and and now are fighting it a great deal. What if we just tried to figure out a beautiful way to help other people celebrate a holiday that might or might not be our own. Uh, Mimuna, thank you. Um, I'm so grateful for the 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 help. Um, uh, Elliot, to your comment, I, I actually, I, I'm not saying in terms of like, let's blend all of the stuff together. I'm saying in almost in the spirit of pluralism, I would love to show up for my Christian friends for their holiday without it necessarily becoming my own. Um, and and what if that were somehow okay and an affirmative practice for me as somebody who is uh, deeply Jewish and has wonderful family, friends, others who are Christian that I want to show up for because I love them. Um, so that would be my open question. Are there some really positive possibilities here? Are we so, again, afraid of the bogeyman of Christmas now that we can't look to the possibilities of affirmative practice? Wonderfully said, Josh. And just would uh, also to that point, encourage everyone, uh, if you have not read uh, Mordecai Kaplan's Judaism as a Civilization, or if you haven't read it in a while, I encourage you to dust it off and turn to the section where he talks actually about Hanukkah, because we can really credit Mordecai Kaplan with the creation of the blue and white lights and the encouragement to be giving presents on Hanukkah. Um, because what he was saying is actually we should learn from the thing that everyone wants to be at rather than be scared of it and then bring it in. And so to the degree that Hanukkah has been reinvigorated over the past century is really credit to somebody who is willing to exactly live that out, Josh. And so thank you. I think that's really important to lift up. I just say, you know, I get very, I, I have come to the place of getting um, nervous about policing terminology, not because language is important. Actually, I think language is incredibly important. But at times in our efforts to police language, we end up leaving people out. And just to give an illustration, um, about 14 years ago, I had the chance to start um, with a number of our um, congregants, what became known as our Shirenu Initiative. This is an initiative for families with disabilities, uh, families with special needs. And it was really a huge learning process for me um, in so many important ways of how we can expand the tent of belonging here um, beyond the idea of inclusion really into a sense of belonging. And I very early on found out that some of the language, for example, the language of disability, using the word disability, was very important for some families and it alienated and actually otherized some others. Some families loved the term disability, or sorry, uh, special needs. And some felt very offended by the term special needs. Some like the term differently abled. And what I started to learn is actually, it's almost bringing a constant sense of curiosity. There are some Jews for whom the ritual of eating Chinese food on Christmas is incredibly important and maybe the most defining ritual of the year for them. And I wouldn't want to eliminate the idea that that can be a part of a Jewish response to Christmas, but I also wouldn't want to come with the assumption. And so I think so much of this is being able to allow in our own language and the desire to elevate sensitivity in other people to also not at the same time eradicate something that may be sacrosanct to them. So it's always a great idea, in my opinion, when making a statement of saying some, some Jews, you know, some families that may be differently abled like this term of special needs or disability, you know, differently abled. And so I, just an invitation really for us that in the growth of greater sensitivity, also I think needs to come the space of humility of simply allowing there to be an openness and helping that as we hear people give their own texture of what they feel comfortable about, let that adjust the way that we use our own language. Can I ask when you... Uh, 
what what you think about um, uh, expressing a preference that a that a uh, or inquiring whether a prospective date or mate is is Jewish. Happily, I also want to hear from Rabbi Frisch. I'm sorry. Rabbi. Yeah, I'm sorry, Robin. I didn't mean to. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say just a little bit to add on to what Ben said, um, because I do think for many Jewish people that is part of their identity. And I will say, for better or for worse, when I meet young couples, Jewish, Jewish, or Jewish, and you know whatever other faith or partner may be or not be, that the Jewish partners or both Jewish partners' identity is I didn't celebrate Christmas and I went to Chinese food on Christmas Eve. But even beyond that, I think that not everyone gets invited to a Christmas dinner or, you know, gets to share it with family or friends. And I've seen, you know, I've heard people complain, oh, it's really insensitive of our synagogue to do this on Christmas Eve. And I think similar to how Ben was talking, there are ways to do it sensitively, that it's fine to have a program on Christmas Eve and say, you could even acknowledge, we know that some of you will be spent celebrating Christmas with family members and friends. For those of you who aren't, we're doing this. And to make it clear that there's no judgment on those people who can't come because they're doing something else. But for those who may not have another option and who may consider going to Chinese food on Christmas Eve, I don't think that has to be considered a bad thing. I think there's a whole other conversation of latkes, which are you know inherently Jewish versus I, I guess some would say that Christmas Eve um, Chinese food is inherently Jewish, even if they're eating pork, whatever, <laughs> that's Jewish for them. Um, but this idea of things that have become like Jewish in recent years, like, you know, more culture, it's, it's hard to find cultural from religious, but lots and bagels and latkes and things and lots and bagels um, and Chinese food versus, on the other hand, things like latkes and like Hanukkah, which are part of the tradition over a longer term. I do think that there is a, a qualitative difference between them. Thanks to all. I will say, um, as a kid from an interfaith family growing up in the 80s, so dating myself, um, I felt a sense of othering um, that I didn't truly understand until I was an adult when our synagogues or summer camps or the places um, where my Jewish identity was formed and where I came to articulate it, um, when they talked in a collective way about the experience that happened uh, over Christmas of Jews going to the movies and, and Chinese food. And uh, because I was going to my grandma's house, who, blessed memory, who was Russian Orthodox um, for, Christmas, for Christmas dinner. And um, I always felt left out. Like I didn't get this kind of collective Jewish experience um, that, all of my friends were having. And so to me, I think it's not so much of, a, you know, is it a microaggression or not, but it, it, but it is about the sensitivity of it, of, of acknowledging that um, the people in our communities have lots of different experiences around the December holidays and, um, and raising up what those experiences might be. Um, and so not leaving it so that people feel closeted about where they're going and how they're spending Christmas um, but that they have an opportunity to, to talk about it because I will also say I have never felt more Jewish than I did when I when I've sat in at a midnight mass in a Catholic church on Christmas Eve. And I think that there is something that happens when we participate in the religious and spiritual traditions uh, of our loved ones that also serves as a way for us to clarify our own identities and roles and participation. Um, so, okay, let's um, move on to our next question. And um, Ed, I'm going to take yours that you um, that you threw out here uh, because I think it's actually a really interesting. One is, you know, is it okay to ask uh, a person who is bringing home a significant other? Is it okay to inquire about their religious identity? Specifically, is it okay to ask if they're Jewish? Um, and let's go in reverse order here. So that will be what Robin, uh, Robin Josh, Ben, Ed. I think it depends how you ask and what your goal is. I have someone I'm very close to who constantly tells me, my group of friends have totally succeeded. All of our kids have married someone Jewish. 
which like just gets at me the way she says it, as if someone whose kids hasn't married someone Jewish has not succeeded. And I find that very disturbing. Um, I think if you're asking about someone and, and that's part of what you're curious of, in a bigger sense of identity, I think if it's the sole question, oh, you're bringing home a Jewish kid, are they Jewish? That would concern me. But if you're asking in the context of other questions, um, I, I just, I think it's a hard, an it's hard to answer without a greater context. I know as a parent, I would be curious about that, but I would also be curious about lots of other things. And I think it's more of what does the answer mean? And do we say, oh, don't bring them home or we're going to do something different when they come or, you know, suddenly we're going to celebrate Shabbat for the first time ever and make a really big deal out of it. That I would find troubling. But if it's we're going to welcome them as who they are, I'm just trying to learn about this person. Um, I don't know, maybe because my husband and I are rabbis. So I think that would be something we're curious about just in general. Um, but I would hope to say that if that were the case, that we would say, great, I can't wait to meet them. And if, if there's someone who talks about the religion, I'd want to learn about it. I certainly wouldn't push them to talk about it. Um, but I think that would be one of the things I'd be curious about. So I, I think it's really interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, to uh, Rabbi Gubitz, I happen to agree, Jen, I think you're exactly right. I think that uh, we have been indoctrinated with the Jewish continuity trope and whether we most folks in my circles would never say that we are looking for racial purity. Um, but when we put as the pinnacle or the great secret to long lasting relationships is just marry somebody who's Jewish. Um, we forget the fact that actually the very challenges that faced Jewish Jewish couples are actually very similar dynamics of challenges that faced any relationship. And in some ways, it's more complicated marrying somebody of the same faith because then you're looking at the same pattern and uh, likely different family origins and understandings of how that expresses. So a person who's Jewish, marrying another person who's Jewish, may have a complete different understanding of what a Passover Seder looks like. And that might be a much more emotional debate over coming to a shared coherence than somebody who is of a different faith. So I also think it's interesting because the questions we ask tend to elevate what we think is most important. So if we find that we're asking the question, is this person Jewish? I think it's worth stepping back and saying, are we really curious about whether they're Jewish or are we wanting to get to know who they are? And if that's the case, the more general the question, the more expansive are the answers. And so if we're really looking to know more about who our kid is dating, I would say, tell me more about this person. I'd love to know who they are. Um, and if we can't come up with a better ex reason for why we want to know a certain data point, or if we're missing that the real goal is to get to know them more, then it probably says something about our own implicit biases. Um, to Lev's point, and I think it also gives us an opportunity to use better language that ultimately knits together a more um, cohesive relationship from the very get-go. So who's is it, Josh? Whose turn is it? Yes. Me? Uh, I thought it was Josh. Josh and Ed. Yeah. My apologies. I love hearing what Ed has to say. So I immediately <laughs> silenced myself and wanted to hear a um, couple of thoughts. I mean, I, I think that Rabbi Gubitz put it exactly right, that there is a pastoral element to this. Um, I always wonder what else is going on for families. What is really at stake in the conversation in which they're meeting a, a their, their beloved child's potential mate and partner? I also find it fascinating. It's Judaism as a noun versus a verb once again. People who have not been inside a JCC, synagogue, uh, Israeli restaurant, uh, Broadway show about a Jewish topic, whatever, who don't study, don't daven, don't read Jewishly connected books, who do not do Jewish stuff in the typical ways that we think about it, even very, very broadly defined, lo and behold, their child brings home someone who is not genetically Jewish, and they have just become the most traditionally observant Jew the world has ever found. And that is an emotional reaction. That is a non-rational response to something. It takes a lot more to unpack than I can possibly do in a minute. But it goes again to 
what does Judaism actually mean? How, what role do you want it to actually play in your life? In what ways do you want to live it out? And maybe you have not succeeded in living it out in those ways. And therefore you want to live a little vicariously and have your child do all of this stuff that you don't do. Say this only as a parent of a four-year-old. I don't know what it is to raise an adult child, but he really does mimic all of my habits down to four-letter words and everything else. And do as I say and not as I do just doesn't seem to work, except with those four-letter words when he just does what I say and not what I do. And so I'm just guessing that there's a lot of insecurity being manifested and a lot of own um, relational issues with Judaism being manifested and a lot of inherited trauma being manifested. And once again, how can we positively speak about Judaism as a verb? Because if we can start there about the actions that are Jewish, that we would love to continue forward in our homes, potentially in the lives of other people we love, takes down a lot of barriers and focuses on meaning over bloodline. So um, uh, Judy Goldberg, who I don't know in the chat said, these, they refer to these as visceral reactions and their residual tribalism, which is what I was gonna say. Um, uh, maybe this is true of older people like me, but but it, it it's it, it's I think it for many people of my era it's like a knee jerk reaction when when asked about you know someone is dating or someone's dating someone's getting married is the person Jewish it's like it just comes out and I do think it's a reflection of a of a deep seated tribalistic attitude that is not in this day and age is not really helpful um, and I think like Ben said it would be good if the question uh, I'm also very curious about people and uh, and and um, it would be good if the question could be asked in a more general way. Um, that oh oh is it what what's the does this person have a religious background? I'm and indicating that it doesn't really matter. But but when when the knee jerk is is the person Jewish comes out, it really is suggesting that the person thinks it's really important. And as like Josh just to, you know explain, people get all um, excited about it. Um, I can't help but telling uh, thinking of this story. Um, uh, both of my uh, children married. The most wonderful partners who are not Jew who are not Jewish, and um, both of them are now very Jewishly involved. One in a Reform synagogue in, in this area, and one at Mishkan in Chicago. And uh, uh, when the second one got engaged, a very dear friend of mine said to my wife and me, "Nice to me, nice work, Edmund. Two for two. Uh, you know, both of my children had intermarried." Uh, it, um, and I, and I think, you know, that that's the kind of attitude that I think uh, has to be worked on, worked on some way that 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 really is not a productive, it's not a productive way to, to think. It's like a gut punch. Uh, last comment. Um, I will just add, I think, in addition to tribalism, I think the question, this question to me, often gets at, um, I think, something we we don't speak about which is a whole lot, which is the fear that undergirds um, the question, which is like, are my children going to carry on uh, the Jewish values that I have, uh, that I so desperately want them to, or have they, will they pick a spouse um, who I believe is good enough for them? Uh, or, you know, I just, I think that it, it if we unpack it, it, it is about so many more things uh, than, than simply as, uh, as I think it was Josh who put the, the noun of Judaism. Um, okay, let's move on. It is, let's talk a little bit, let's talk a little bit about um, co-officiation and along with that, um, children, raised in um, two religious traditions or backgrounds. Um, and I will say before I, I, I get a question now, that I think that there is a tremendous um, spectrum of experience and behavior around what it means to expose your kids to more than one religious identity or more than one religious tradition. 
ranging uh, and and that that may ebb and flow throughout uh, people's lives. And I just want to acknowledge that on the front end of this, because I think it is a much more complicated topic than is often discussed in the nuance that I think maybe it deserves. So um, that said, should rabbis co-officiate at life, life cycle events, at weddings, at baby namings or baby welcomings um, with clergy of other faith backgrounds? And in addition, uh, Mike's kind of two-part question here, is what position should liberal rabbis and Jewish communities take on families who raise their children um, in with two religious identities, however you define that. Uh, and if you want to pack that a little bit around uh, this topic, feel free. Um, and we are going to, let's see, let's have uh, Ben, Robin, Josh, Ed. So I love this question. Thank you so much, Shodi. And um, to step back and then I'll step right into it for a moment. Um, one of the former chancellors of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Gerson Cohen, put forward a very famous paper many years ago called The Blessings of Assimilation. And effectively, he lifts up uh, a lens on Jewish history that sees that the times when Judaism flourished the most in population and in vibrancy, the production of poetry um, and philosophy and commentary were always the times when the barriers were lowest with the outside world beyond Judaism. And he lifts this up in order to counter the narrative that assimilation always equals bad, and meaning we always, always in a Jewish world mean assimilate out. And we don't really talk about the fact that what is the great secret of Judaism is how nimble we are to assimilate in. The way that we have been able to adapt in so many different paradigms and geographies and eras is our willingness to learn from what's the best of what's around and incorporate it in. So for me, if a person's sitting in the question of what is going to guarantee the vibrancy and vitality of the future of Judaism, I don't think that it's going to be by stepping into policing the margins of it. I actually think it's going to be continuing to recenter on how Judaism meets the needs of people. And if we start to find that Jewish leadership is no longer reflective of the realities of our people and our constituency, however you want to define our, it means that we will no longer be effective leaders and they will go elsewhere to be led by those that are speaking in the vocabulary and living out the realities that exist in their lives. So as a person who has sat in innumerable conversations about this, about the reasons why rabbis or cantors should not co-officiate with other clergy of other faiths, I just have to say at the end of the day, when we look at an interfaith marriage rate of what we have in this country, this is not only an inevitability that we're going to see the majority of our constituents are going to be sitting in multiple faiths dynamics in their household, but it's already present. And so part of what I think this is, is acknowledging what is our real goal as being a Jewish clergy person? Is our goal to lift up a prior definition of authenticity? In which case, that's great. Museum curation is a fantastic profession and encourage that pivot. I also think, though, what has made great rabbis over the centuries, over the millennia, has been the rabbis being the one to acknowledge that ultimately Judaism is led by the people, not by the rabbis. And what rabbis and cantors really are doing is helping to give the vocabulary, the structure, the ritual to help cohere people together to have their needs met. So for me, I have no issue co-officiating as long as I would ask of the couple or the family what I would ask of any couple or family, which is that we bring intention to it and make sure that we are bringing forward tools that actually elevate the meaning and connection of the family, create a sacred moment, and reflect what I think will ensure the vitality of Judaism's future by saying Jewish tools will help meet the needs of today and tomorrow. So I will say that when Alexander, who's on this webinar, and I were interviewing the fellows for our current cohort, and we asked, where are your boundaries? Where do you currently feel most challenged? Maybe all but one or two cases, every single person we interviewed said co-officiation and dual faith back. Those are really, we're finding the big issues out there that challenge rabbis that can be difficult, but they don't want to ignore because it's the reality of the people they serve and they want to figure out how they can serve those 
those people in a way that is both comfortable for them and meaningful for the people. And I've noticed among not just the fellows, but many of my rabbinic colleagues, there are those who will say, I am a rabbi, I officiate Jewish weddings. I'm totally fine if one of those partners was a Jewish, but I'm going to stick to what I do as a rabbi doing a Jewish wedding. Um, and that, well, Jody's heard me say a million times that if I had to pick someone who was ordained with me 23 years ago, who I never officiated an interfaith wedding, it would have been me. Um, but here I am 23 years later, and not only do I officiate, I have co-officiated um, what has been some of the most beautiful experiences for me. And I find it, it's something I'm most comfortable doing when the partner who's not Jewish is religious. Because what I see is two human beings standing in front of me. And one of those human beings may have a really close relationship with their priest, or they may have a really close relationship to Catholicism, but not be where they grew up, but want to have that in some way as part of their ceremony. So it can be more challenging and more work, and we have to work things out that everyone's comfortable. But you know, I think it really gets into it. And, and I think Ben was talking about this as well. What is the role of Jewish clergy today or liberal Jewish clergy today? And yes, my role is absolutely to bring the Judaism to that moment. But I feel that my role is also to create meaningful events, life cycle events for those people who are standing in front of me. And often they're not both Jewish. And I don't want to ignore the, the internal love for their own tradition or even just connection or you know some people say oh they just wanted a rabbi because that's what their grandmother wanted or the mother wanted you know what that's great they're honoring their mother their grandmother if they want me there for that reason and i have the opportunity to bring judaism to them great and that may be true for the person of the other tradition as well so for me personally my journey has led me to a much greater comfort with that because of this idea that Whatever the future may bring, and I know there's been a lot of you know Jewish continuity, and that, and, and I agree, it's it's more important what's going to happen than what happens in the life cycle or what religion the person is they're marrying. But at that moment, there are two people standing before me, and I want the that occasion to be meaningful to both of them. As far as dual faith, you know, I was just talking to a colleague the other day. We all, many of us, cited statistics for years that kids who grow up with two faiths are going to grow up confused and they're going to have to choose between their parents. Um, I know Fern sure talks on this call. I don't know if she knows, but I am unaware of any sociologist who has ever shown that, of any study that's shown that. We as rabbis like to quote that all the time, but I, I don't know that it's true. Um, I think it's complicated. I, you know, I, in a minute, can't give an answer to it, but I think it's something that we as Jewish leaders have to pay attention to. We can't just write off these families. There are a lot of families that want to have Judaism as part of their lives, and we're going to have to figure out a way that is meaningful to welcome them into our communities and to work with them to have them be entitled to the Judaism that they want to have in their family. And it, it, it's not always going to be easy, but I think we're, we'd be making a big mistake as an entire community to say, we're not going to try and we're not going to figure out a way to do this. I'd like to respond in two different unpopular ways. So um, the, the first is to say that uh, I think there's an element of rabbinic or clergy narcissism in saying no to ceremonies that make us uncomfortable, even if they do not make the people getting married uncomfortable. Um, and the people getting married probably do not want religion or community or however you want to frame Judaism. Uh, they do not want it to be a source of conflict. And if it becomes a source of conflict, then we are both doing potential harm to the relationship and certainly to their relationship with uh, Judaism in all of its verb forms. Um, so, so that is, uh, I think, one piece. Um, at the same time, and I say this just not for the sake of being provocative, but, but I do think it's important to talk about tension inherent in different belief systems. They do not cohere perfectly. They are, to a certain extent, internally consisting, consistent, self-reinforcing systems of practice. There are fundamental differences in many forms of practice and community. And so long as everyone is able to talk about it in a truthful, loving way, so long as we are able to talk about the tensions and discomfort, so long as the couple is able to, then I think we are doing well by the couple. And whether or not they decide to have kids, they'll at least have tools to navigate the tension. What I'm worried about in this conversation, something that has not come up, is 
boundaries in a positive way. And I'm not saying that these should be, you know, reinforced steel walls, but I'm saying that describing moments of tension and discomfort and areas of real difference is an important part of counseling couples who do not view the world in exactly the same way, which lo and behold is true for the overwhelming majority of couples, but should be expressed uh, or at least discussed as it pertains to religious, spiritual, and communal practice. So I don't I don't have much to add to this 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 question. Uh, I, I I think I take a what I would call a utilitarian uh, calculation. I like like I said at the beginning, and I think like Ben and Josh have said, there our interest is having more people do do more Jewish. And I think if a couple wants to have a co officiated wedding, then uh, it's important for uh, there to be rabbis readily available to them. Because if because it holds the door open for later Jewish engagement, whereas a, a refusal, uh, I think, is going to be off putting and will and will lead to a less likelihood of, of Jewish engagement. Um, uh, and I feel the same way about uh, uh, baby welcoming ceremonies. Also, uh, um, um, you know, the, the uh, if a child has a Jewish baby welcoming ceremony, it really it does not determine that the child's going to be Jewishly engaged later on. And if a child is 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 baptized, it doesn't it doesn't ensure that a, the child's going to be engaged and engaged Christian later on. Uh, um, it's a uh, these are welcome these are ceremonies that welcome people into communities and the, and uh, it leads it leaves doors open to say yes and it and it and it tends to close doors to say no. Um, I'm interested in what what Josh just said about tension. I I, I don't know exactly. It was a little unclear what we're referring to. If you're referring to, um, and there obviously are differences between religions. If you're, um, I think I would like to. I, I'd be curious to know if you're talking about uh, you know having Jesus at the wedding. Um, is that I don't know if that's what you're. What, what well, you're, I'm talking what, about faith versus um, action. So, so you know, does faith lead to just action? Do just does just action lead to faith? Um, I'm talking about sort of notions of personal God versus sort of you know question mark about many forms God can take. Um, I'm talking about uh, you know in certain practices. I, I think in in terms of Buddhism, iconography can be really challenging for those of a Jewish background that have. Um, uh, sort of clear definitions around what is permissible and not around iconography. And so I think that there are points of real tension and, and ultimately choices to be made. Um, you know, do we have a statue of Buddha or not? And uh, there is a bimodal choice in that moment, but there can be multiple different sets of values that go into deciding one way or another. And you can say that is not an idol to me. That is an ideal form of a human being, but it is not the idol I am worshiping. It is a reminder of an idealized form of a person, but should probably talk about why a lot of rabbinic Judaism and Judaism, even in pre-rabbinic forms, really dissuades us from having uh, graven images. Why did that matter at the time? Why was that so important? So there that's what I meant, I think, is that, that there are fundamental differences, and sometimes you got to make really tough choices. And as long as people know some of those choice points and can delve into the tension, it can be productive. I hope that's helpful. Yep, thank you. Yeah, that seems, um, that seems exactly right to me. Uh, this piece of, uh, it makes me think of the, the phrase, clear is kind, unclear is unkind, and that when we have explicit conversations about uh, sometimes challenging or tension tense topics, that we have the potential to come out the other side in a way that is um, that is really fruitful and that brings us um, closer together and brings us to greater understanding and 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 greater opportunities for for dialogue with each other um, and. I think I there is I think so much to be learned about how families make spiritual and religious choices uh, over the lives of their familyhood. Um, that I think we could we could all do with some more dialogue around that, both 
in uh, familial settings as well as institutional settings. Um, I am, let's go to uh, the chat now and which maybe a couple of questions, a lot of really interesting comments here. Um, but one that I think is, is mostly for Ben and Josh here. Can you speak more specifically about how you would define liberal Judaism or Jewish identity in the affirmative rather than the negative? What are the foundational ideas? What are some practical ways we Jewish professionals can promote identity formation around those positive ideas rather than uh, the negative ones? It's a great question. So uh, it's a really great question, actually, because um, I think what it gets at is maybe different ways of imagining boundaries and buckets of American Judaism outside of kind of classic denominational um, uh, categories, which most of us are not, uh, at least most people in my orbit, are not, not defining themselves as reform or conservative or orthodox based on great philosophical principles, but on just lived realities of who's in the community and what it feels like. Um, so I would say, for me, the way I would define liberal Judaism is to what degree do you believe that Judaism has been an ongoing, ever-evolving process that continues to recenter on human needs? For me, all of the liberal streams of Judaism openly embrace that that is a reality uh, as we look at the arc of Jewish history. And in owning that in an intellectually honest way, we then can debate and discuss how do we continue that mechanism of recentering on human needs and continuing to make sure that Judaism is a part of the lived uh, ethic of people. Uh, that's basically the most basic way that I could define that. Um, some others might define it as, are you focused on, um, to what degree do you include, are you focusing your energy on expanding the bounds of Judaism? Or to what degree are you trying to focus on ratify and solidify the boundaries of Judaism? Um, I've heard other people define it that way. So those are the two definitions I've heard. I happen to like the former one a little bit more. As is usual, I agree with Ben. Um, one of the things that I'd, I wanna raise up is um, sort of a theme that came up a lot in conversation with uh, Rabbi Leon Morris, it came up in conversation uh, with others in reviewing historical documents. It's a, a re-emphasizing study as a really powerful spiritual tool. And why study? Because it enables us to delve into issues with nuance and complexity at a time of simple sound bites and polarization. And it enables us to surface those issues uh, human purposes that really could stand out to us in a time when a lot of people are searching for greater meaning in their lives. And study is something that, that I think we have de-emphasized systematically in the American Jewish community. We've prioritized worship and prayer. Part of that is us integrating, and that's real and well and lovely. But Jewish forms of study, debate, dialectic, approaches to text are pretty sui generis and are a remarkable universal contribution that people who are not Jewish can delve into. Uh, and, and uh, you know, all human beings in the world would probably enjoy a great deal in some form or fashion. And they help us get to these positive purposes. They help us get to the multiplicity of positive purposes embedded in core Jewish text and no one can mess with them or challenge their uh, authenticity. Um, we talk a lot about an authenticity trap. And when you're studying Talmud, when you're studying Midrash, when you're studying classical texts, somehow they pass muster as Jewish enough for everyone and accessible enough for everyone. And that is a rarity and probably a good place to start. I think this question of an authenticity trap actually um, goes well with the next question I want to ask from the chat. And the writer says, I'm not defending the non-observant parents who become almost militant about their child dating or marrying someone of a different faith. However, it feels to me like a harsh judgment of those parents to say that it's because they didn't go to temple or something else. 
So does that mean it's more acceptable for observant Jews to get similarly upset? I think in, in the example given, I was trying to, to elevate um, how atypical it is of particular parents to all of a sudden flaunt observance that they have not shown at other moments. So I, I apologize for, for once again being gauche and flip, um, but I was trying to elevate the inconsistency of conduct and, and suggest that there is something emotional and pastoral happening at that particular moment that would evoke all of a sudden a rush of traditional observance that is not observable or practiced at any other time. Um, I, I think it is really well said. Um, I, I do think that there are different points of pain for different parents in different kinds of communities. Um, having spoken with and uh, connected with uh, parents from very traditional backgrounds, in some cases when I'm doing an interfaith wedding, there, there's almost a vidui that they express to me individually. And I don't want to invalidate their feelings. Like they are feeling grief and loss and pain and they can feel what they feel and not take it out on their children or their new child-in-law. Um, and so there has to be a both. The question is, in what forum are they expressing those feelings? And I would strongly advise that those parents find a forum that is non-familial, that is therapeutic, that is with a clergy person, that is with some friends, other sources of support so they can express what they need to and then enter into deep relationship. And so forthrightly, I do wonder if traditionally observant people um, experience different levels of grief or strong emotions. I don't know, but that has been sort of correlated to my experience. Um, and the question is, how do we support them in navigating those very real feelings that have a lot of significance in their lives without letting it damage relationship and alienate people who they should be close to? I want to thank Josh. I think that's really important. I don't think we should deny the feelings of parents or grandparents because things can be really hard. It's a matter of how you deal with those emotions. And it might not be depending on your relationship with your child, there's so many factors, you can't make a generalization, but it might be a discussion you need to have with a rabbi or even a therapist um, and not your child at a certain point. I don't think the pain should be denied or made to feel illegitimate, but there's also an adult child making their own decisions that you have to respect. And I just want to share a beautiful story. I haven't spoken to them yet because um, so they were leaving town and we missed each other, but I was emailing with a modern Orthodox couple who reached me through 18 Doors who was very upset because their daughter is in a very serious relationship with someone who isn't Jewish, but in no way did they want to upset her by sharing their, I'm sure she knew to some extent, but she invited them over to the home she had just moved into with her partner in December. And the father wrote to me the next day and said, we showed up and there were Christmas decorations outside. And he said, I kind of cursed under my breath. Then I put on a smile and I went and I just thought that was really beautiful because I'm sure it was incredibly painful with him and I don't, you know, for him. And I think that's a legitimate, and he, you know, our feelings are real and legitimate, but his way was to share, at least at that moment, to come email me, to curse under his breath, to email me, to set up a conversation with me, but to spend time with her, his daughter and her partner. He said, I don't want anything to come in between our relationship. Now, I know that doesn't always happen, whether you're modern Orthodox or any other brand of Judaism, but the, or, you know, just Jewish. But the fact that, you know, this is someone we would expect to be so judgmental that he couldn't have a relationship with his daughter. And he just said, my, my relationship with my daughter comes first, and I'm going to figure out how to deal with my emotions. I will also say one of the reasons um, that 18 Doors began doing grandparenting programming uh, and began an email newsletter for grandparents was because we saw the important role that grandparents or parents of adult children play in the lives of their children and their families. And that uh, when they don't have a space and there are lots of different spaces out there, counselors, rabbis, uh, 18 doors, 
when they don't have a space and when they uh, when they go back to their children, that that has really damaging long term effects. Uh, and I, it makes me think of uh, when my oldest brother, who was married to someone who is uh, who's Catholic, when they started dating, um, my sister in law's mom uh, called my 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 mom and said, what are we going to do about the children? And my mom, and I give her a lot of credit for this, my mom said, we're gonna, um, we're not gonna do anything. We're gonna love them. We're gonna support them. And we're going to get to, let them get to know each other and see where the relationship takes them. Uh, and I think that that was the beginning of a wonderful relationship that she has with, uh, not only with my brother, but with my sister-in-law. Um, we have time for one last question here. Um, and I think it's a great one. It comes to us uh, from our longtime board member, Ruth Nemzoff. Um, what is the difference between tribalism and community? We think community is supportive and wonderful, but isn't also tribalism in some way. So while initially community has open borders, it's, it too can be closed off. So I'm, I'm curious about uh, our panelists, your reaction to that idea. Well, I think I, I think I'm repeating myself. I, I think that uh, there are there are things that are distinctively Jewish. I mean, their Jewish traditions are distinctively Jewish. Uh, engaging them in engaging in them in community with other Jewishly engaged people is distinctively Jewish. And um, to me, that that is uh, what a what a community does. But in our in the in our current situation, with our seventy two percent rate of intermarriage that that, that uh, has been referred to repeatedly, it doesn't serve our purposes to say that our community only it only includes people who are Jewish, and it can't it doesn't include it doesn't have a porous boundary that can that uh, can include people who are interested who want to who want to participate. I mean, and to me, um, I to me when I hear tribalism, I, I, to me that's an attitude that says no, that's not that isn't okay. It's really just us, and and we 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 don't we we it, 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 there's a danger to us if, if we let other people in. What will happen? Ben, Josh, Robin, anything else to add? Any more to add? I mean, just to build on that, really, and Josh and I talked about this actually a great deal in the book, is I think it's where you decide to put your energy, is are you focusing your energy on how you count in, or are you focusing your energy on how you exclude and count out? And um, for me, I think one of the things that I lament is that the term tribalism has largely been appropriated to indicate the counting out and excluding when social science lets us know that the most effective medium in which people can feel a sense of belonging is in a small group of usually eight to 12 people. Um, there's some wisdom behind, you know, the prayer quorum in Judaism of it being, you know, 10 people. Um, and so the idea of having a tribe, the idea of having a circle of belonging, I think is not inherently bad. In fact, that's how we're, seems to be, according to social science, how we're wired. The question is, are we getting definition by that tribe by um, lifting up who doesn't get to be in it? Or in that tribe, does it give us the security to say, oh, those who aren't in it, there might be really opportunity there. Maybe we should go and bring them in. And I think it's that that's the difference in orientation. Probably. I'll take this opportunity to lift up um, Ann Becker's comment that tribes exclude, communities include. I think there's some truth to that. That is, that is a question of framing as much as a, a, of anything here when you're talking about tribalism versus community. And I think about it in the context of uh, an openness to who belongs and who is there while you may and will still have communal norms and mores. Um, it is 25 after the hour. I wanna thank uh, my panelists and all of you who are in attendance tonight and participate in the chat. 
Um, I, I hope you'll take a few minutes to provide us with feedback on this event so we can better program in the future. There's a link to a survey in the chat right now, and we'll, uh, we will also send it out to participants afterward um, to gather your feedback. And um, take a moment now, if you're interested in other programs that we do, you can check them out at our website. You can sign up for a variety of our email newsletters, and a variety of topics at our website, www.18doris.org. And uh, again, I wanna thank Ben and Josh for writing a really uh, inspiring, interesting book and interviewing as many people as they did along the way, uh, including myself and Ed for um, his leadership on this and Robin for all the great work that you do and continue to do in the world. Uh, thank you all, have a wonderful night and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.